so I'm just going to kick into it because last of the day and yeah, I'm going to be talking about letting them play. So children will play anywhere, uh, you know, play is how a child's brain develops and how it grows and often the outdoors unlocks opportunities that are just not available in an indoor environment. So. Often when we are talking about children playing, we associate that with young children. But actually, there is a great amount of value of play that is often diminished as children get older. We don't see it as a thing that older children do. Uh, but, you know, children don't just suddenly one day stop playing. They don't suddenly go into primary school and, and suddenly they, they're not interested in the sandpits. They don't suddenly go into high school and they don't want to climb the monkey bars anymore. They still enjoy playing. It can just look a little different. And so in, in this uh, next 20 or so minutes, I'm just going to talk about some of those differences and, and why we still need to value that as children get older, as they become students, teenagers, but also just getting you to reflect on your own play and how you play as an adult and what that might look like. The other thing about play is that there are just so many benefits and there has been a bit of talk about the nature uh, from John, I think it was earlier on, and the benefits around that. Some of those same benefits of time and nature are the same for play. So we're looking at our social, our emotional, our physical, and our spiritual. And it's giving us lots of kind of um, skills around dispositions and key competencies. So supporting our self-belief, our confidence, it helps us to problem solve, how to negotiate and navigate difficult conversations, persist with things. And, you know, it's all building so much resilience through these opportunities of play. And so what I want to say is that, you know, perhaps play would be more respected if we called it something like self-motivated practice of life skills. <laughs> you know, if we called it that, there might be a little bit more buy-in. Because even when we ask teenagers, oh, how do you play? They're like, we don't play. Yeah, so if we can, can kind of frame it differently and look at it differently, that might help us out. And I really want to just share a brief story with you from my own childhood, and it was a, it was a pivotal moment. It was actually for my teenage years where I recognised that I had gathered some of these skills that I've just talked about, and they helped me through a challenging time. So, picture this. I'm 14 years old. I'm at our family batch in the Marlborough Sounds, you know, beautiful blue tur turquoise water, native bush and forest coming down to the water line. And I have decided that I am going to do the family challenge. And the family challenge was to swim from the head of our bay all the way out and across to the other side of the sound. So it was about a 2K swim, and I'm 14 years old. And I head upstairs and open the door, and my grandma and mum were sitting there, and I said, I'm going to do the swim today. And my grandma turned to me and said, you're not strong enough, you won't make it. <gasps> I'd just been challenged. I, I thought I was ready. And then suddenly I've got this voice inside my head going, oh my gosh, what if, what if you're not strong enough? Did I have the courage to, to persist and, and give it a go? And I just started getting a little bit worked up inside and then suddenly I found myself saying, well, I'm going to swim there and back to prove you wrong. <laughs> that was that. That was my challenge to myself. Didn't realise I was going to be going there and back, but I put on my togs. Mum decided to come down and help me in the support boat. Standing at the end of the wharf, deep breaths in. And I dove in the water. And I was just talking to myself the whole way. I can do this, I can do this. One, one arm in front of the other, keep swinging, swimming. I set many goals, there was a boat halfway th along the bay. I was like, right, just get to there, get to there, right. Get to the head of the bay. Got there, swimming, I can do this, I can do this. I, then there was an island, I was like, right, get to the island, get to the island. Cool, cool, breathing. Keep going, keep going, and suddenly the wharf was in sight. And I was just getting closer and closer, and I found my feet on the ground. I stood up, and Mum gave me some food and drink, and phew, halfway there, right, OK, got to go. And I did the same on the way back. It was one stroke after the other, one stroke after the other. I got past the island, the head of the bay, the boat, and then suddenly I felt my hand 
touching the wharf. Out of the water, a big smile on my face, straight up to Gran, where are you, Gran? I did it, and she congratulated me. And, you know, it was such a powerful moment in my life. I probably didn't realise it then, but I had just drawn on so many different experiences that I'd had during my childhood to help me get through that and to help me keep going. I could have given up, but I had enough experience to be able to, you know, keep going. Uh, I'd learned a lot about myself, how I engaged with the world through those play opportunities as a child. And I didn't know it at the time, but I had developed resilience to deal with something that was challenging. So it was a really pivotal moment for me. And, you know, in my childhood, all those things came to the forefront, all those different activities. I had the, the opportunity to explore, to experience new things, to test myself out, to fail, um, to, to pick myself up and keep going. Often there weren't adults around, so I was having to figure things out for myself in these play opportunities. But they gave me this foundation of experience and knowledge that has really helped me in that situation, but it's given me the skills to know that I can actually cope in other situations in my life. There's that resilience, the resilience to keep going and to cope. So just to move in, what is play? We, we talk about this and I want to refer to Peter Gray's five different characteristics that he's pulled into. And if you don't know who Peter Gray is, he is the author of Free to Learn and he's a associate professor at the Boston College over in America. So what is play? Play is self-chosen and self-directed. So it's coming from within. It is intrinsically motivated. So that's something that you want to do. It's not that someone's telling you that you should be doing this. The rules of play are created by the players. So the people or the person who is playing, they're the ones who are choosing it. It's not being told, this is what you must do, or these are your, your guidelines. Play is imaginative, it's creative. And play is conducted in an alert, active, but relatively non-stressed frame of mind. And so that's just saying that sometimes play can look really happy, but also play can look quite serious and focused. So th there's the five character characteristics of play there. And I also want to uh, talk about some of the, the research that's out there. I won't go on about this, but there is so much out there. We've got the academic uh, performance. It's talking about enhancing creativity and enhancing critical thinking and problem solving. So there's some great links as well to subject areas when we're looking into school years. We're also thinking about the enhanced attention. So it gives us focus. Um, there's increased engagement and enthusiasm as well as improving behaviour. So that you know, more impulse control, emotional regulation, being able to lower stress levels. And I know John talked about, you know, just being in nature, seeing nature from our buildings or just being involved or just near nature, it can, it can foster uh, academic performance and success as well. So there's some, lots of research. This has come from the childreninnature.org forward slash research. So if you're looking for research around this, it's just got everything that's out there to date. It's an amazing resource. So another aspect that, we've, that has been touched on in a number of the other talks is about you know, a bit of risk and risk taking. And there are some great benefits for risk taking, especially in the early years. You know, we see children taking risks and we talk about risks and we're meaning uh, play from a height, play with speed, we're thinking about dangerous tools, dangerous elements, so that's the earth, uh, water, fire and air, and also the ability to get lost, hiding places, and rough and tumble. So those are our six elements of risky play, and they come from Alan Sansetter. And, you know, children engaging in those things are learning so much about themselves, they're challenging themselves, stepping outside their comfort zone. They're understanding what they're capable of and what they're not. And when we look at this child here, 
you can see that he is assessing the situation. He's going, am I capable of getting over here? I want to, so I'm going to test it out. He doesn't need to be told this. He naturally is checking how far is it to fall if this does go over when I try. Hmm. He's keeping himself safe the whole time. That, you know, children are capable of doing this and they will do this naturally if we don't interfere with them. And the great thing with, um, with risky play is that they learn all this about themselves when they're younger, if they're given the opportunity, and then they can apply it to other situations later in life. So this is transferable knowledge. For example, when a child is, or you know, someone's a bit older and they're faced with the situation of getting into the car with a drunk driver, perhaps, they can weigh up the risks and benefits. So I've got that problem solving skills, that assessment skills to do that. It could be that they want to take a, a social risk and ask someone out on a date, you know, oh, you know, what are the risks of this? that kind of thing, or when they're going to buy a house and they're figuring out if how much they earn can pay the loan that they're going to have to take out on to get a house. So it's all this experience transfers into other areas of life. It's not just about the physical. But with the physical side, it's really important um, to, to be giving those opportunities to our children. And if you're wondering if he made it, he did make it and little one got him behind there. So, you know, they're, they're capable, and, and it's a proud moment being able to get up there as well. So we've talked about risk-taking and that children are capable, and I want to just share this from um, a study that was conducted out of... It was India, and it happened in Mumbai, and what they did was, um, Mitra, they put a computer in the wall of an external building facing a slum. So they said to the children there, you can just do whatever you want with this. There was no instruction, they were just left to figure it out. And so all these children, they you know, came around this computer and they just started going, oh, what's this do? And they realised that the mouse, when they touched the keypad, it moved on the screen. And so they went, oh, this is interesting. And they just experimented with it and they played. But they did this really collaboratively. They shared information. So when one child learnt something, they then communicated to the other children and said, hey, this is what I've learnt. So they shared and they learnt and taught each other. And within three months, these children had mastered the computer, like all the kind of basic and probably some intermediate type things. So they were able to copy and paste. They were able to navigate through all the different folders. They gave it different names. So the mouse was called a pointer and the folders were called cupboards. So, you know, very practical. Uh, they were able to use the paint function. They could play music. They could download things off the web and write emails and send emails. They had figured this all out collaboratively through just experience experiential type learning without any help from anyone else. So it's, it's quite incredible what they're capable of doing if they're given the time and space. And often they're not given time and space to really experience. There's a lot of constraints that are put around children uh, to, to, you know, you've got this amount of time to do this and if you don't do this, well, then we'll kind of help you out or scaffold you out of that. But it's amazing what can happen if they're given enough time to play. They can, uh, you know, teach themselves quite capably. Right, next one. So the truth is that play seems to be one of the most advanced methods nature has invented to allow a complex brain to create itself. A lot of the research that's been coming out has been coming out mainly over the last 30 or so years. Prior to that, it wasn't really a problem because children just played and everything was A-OK. -okay. But because we have seen a lot of changes, um, over the last few decades, we've got, you know, urbanisation, it's changed the, the landscape of our cities. Cars are a lot faster. We don't have many empty blocks of land that we can go and play in in our neighbourhoods. We've also got, um, you know, technology has had a, a huge impact. Some have said that it has replaced the amount of outdoor play that, that children get. We've got media has projected us into this state that we're, you know, we've got a lot of fear around children going out, and someone mentioned earlier that 
children aren't biking or walking to school so much anymore. And it's that fear that something's going to happen. We're wrapping them in, in bubble wrap, that kind of thing. But there's also a lot of pressure when we think about school and academic performance and getting the right grades. So we've got all these things that have changed over the last few decades, and it's definitely having some impacts on our lives. We've just come out of Mental Health Awareness Week, and I thought it was really relevant to share some of the statistics around that. 20% uh, of young people are likely to experience a mental health issue here in New Zealand. One in five will be affected by depression by the time they're 18. And almost one in five meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder by the age of 19. So there's a lot going on there. If you've heard about what locus of control is, um, I'll just share a little bit about it because I think it links into some of our mental health statistics, or it's something that's good to be aware of. So locus of control, there is an internal and an external locus of control. So when we're talking about internal locus of control, we're talking about the things that we control around us in our life. External locus of control is things that other people control for our life. So, for example, um, school, you know, we've got a structure there. That is an external control. Or if we're going to a sports team, you know, we're told what to do, so that's an external locus of control. Internal locus of control would be us choosing how we spend our time. What the theory is talking about is that when it's out of balance, i.e. there is too many external pressures coming on to people, that we feel out too much out of control, and that's when we can start suffering some of our mental health situa or issues in our lives. So it's really good to be aware of how much control children have over their lives these days, or teenagers, or whoever it is that you're working with. Because what it's suggesting is if they don't feel like they're in control enough, then that's when they start suffering. So it's really good to be aware of that. I'm going to move on from that because there's lots more for that, but that's a general gist. Uh, the other impacts of some of those changes over the decades and the reduction in play is that, you know, lower levels of resilience, and that also links into our mental health. We're also seeing obesity and other health implications. Eyesight, you know, if, raise your hand if you've got glasses. Yes, no, no you don't, Chris, no. Uh, yeah, so, you know, glasses, there's a lot of children coming through needing glasses because they're not using that focus of uh, near and far. They're not engaging enough in outdoor situations to be able to change that focus, so they're starting to need glasses. Lots of things like this. So, we need to prioritise play for all ages. It, gets, it seems to get less and less as they get older, but we know that they will still play. It's just going to look different. So I, I was trying to think, oh, how can I explain this? And I'm thinking the words playfulness and curiosity could be really good words to think about when we're thinking about our older students. You know, I, I'm working with... Uh, preschoolers at the moment in a bush kindy program, they just know how to play. And that is how the curriculum's set up, for them to play. But when we move into our older years, how can we bring in more playfulness and curiosity into what we're doing in an outdoor environment? They love to play. They are natural explorers. They will uh, naturally be curious if they're given the opportunity and it's just how they're wired. But as adults, we are preventing a lot of that from happening. So we need to just start reflecting on, on our own, um, our teaching. And do you know what? I don't think it's actually an easy thing. I know it's, it's easy for me to say, yeah, just put more play in. It's not actually like that. We actually have to think differently about what we're doing. Um, we know that they love to play, but it's not just a, a straightforward path. So, you know, ask some of your, your teenagers, I'm aiming this at high school because it's probably harder to, to be in, but, you know, ask some of the teenagers, what do you like to do in your spare time? You know, what are those things that really, you know, make you feel interested and, and enjoy doing? What are those things? Because they'll give you some feedback that you can then go, oh, OK, this could be something I could weave in. For example, some teenagers I asked last week when I said, 
oh, so what do you, you know, like to play, you know? And they were like, we don't play. I think I mentioned that before. I was like, how can I reword this? What do you do in your spare time? And they were like, oh, we like doing TikTok dances. I'm like, okay, dramatic kind of stuff, cool. Oh, we still like Lego. Um, oh, fort building, fort building's really cool. Oh, we like working out. So there's all these things. And I was like, oh, I just wouldn't have picked a couple of those things at all. But that is how they play and that is how they want to engage. So what is it that we can do with our teaching to weave that in? And I know I'm just talking about play, but it is definitely that nature play. What does that look like in an outdoor space? Oh. So our role is to be innovative. It's to be curious and creative with our teaching. It's to provide regular ongoing opportunities for play or playfulness. And this has been touched on a little bit, but I think it's building it into your philosophy and values. Uh, it has to be a whole school or a whole centre approach. You know, if it's just one teacher driving it, your kids are going to get that, but the rest aren't. And I really believe that we need to be getting a bit deeper into what our values are within, um, within our setting and really looking at that and addressing that. I was talking to Tim earlier, and you know, if one person drives it, when that person leaves, it stops. But this is not just about, about you and your group, this is about an ongoing uh, you know, change in the way we do things. So review your, your philosophy, your purpose. Have a think about your outdoor space. There was a great uh, discussion just before about our outdoor classroom. I think that is a really big place that we can overhaul this. And yeah, it could be an outdoor classroom, but it could also just be looking at what's available for your age group that you're working with for them to play. In early childhood, it's set up for that. We have the sensory play that they need. We have all the elements that they need. In primary school, some of that gets taken away. Only the six and seven year olds are, or five, six and seven year olds are allowed to use the sample. And then there's little red lines where the children are allowed to play. And then they're not allowed on the jungle gym after the age of 10. Is that really what they need? Look at Margaret Mayhew Playground here in Christchurch. You, how many teenagers do we see playing there? They are still happy to play, so I think we need to look at our outdoor spaces and look at what's there and see what we can provide. So if we can use more play or playfulness in our teaching, what does that mean for our students and our children? What does that give them? So just have a wee ponder on that, because I think, you know, we have to be willing to be curious, courageous, and, and step outside our own comfort zones to make this a possibility. Just imagine the potential that we have to, to bring out in our children. We talk a lot about subject areas and stuff, but, you know, this age, this generation really needs us to focus on key competencies and their mental health. So I think we owe it to our children and our students to be bringing in more playfulness and play into what we do. And I guess the last thing um, is how can we harness play or natural curiosity in our age level that we work with? So I'll leave you with that and the challenges are you going to stand on the end of the wharf or are you going to dive in and give it a go and let them play? Kia ora. Thank you.